What's up, Action Tribe? AJ here, host and founder of My 7 Chakras, my7chakras.com, the show where we help you calm your mind, relax your nervous system, and experience deep states of bliss. In today's episode, you're going to learn some really amazing stuff, including understanding the energetic influence of power, the mythic concept of the hero's journey. You'll discover how your ego influences your life and ultimately how to develop your soulful power. And if you watch till the very end, you will get to partake in a little breathwork session as well. So if you'd like to explore these topics and you don't want to miss out, then here are some next steps. Firstly, hit subscribe if you're listening to this on your iPhone. Hit the follow button if you're on Spotify and hit the subscribe and the bell notifications button if you are on YouTube, because doing so does something to the algorithm and helps us get in front of more and more people. It also notifies you about new episodes because currently there are about 81% of people that are subscribed, but some of you are not subscribed yet. So take a se second. So take a second and smash that subscribe button. And with that being said, let's bring on our special guest for today, Christian De La Huerta. With 30 years of experience, Christian is a sought after spiritual teacher, personal transformation coach, and leading voice in the breathwork community. He has traveled the world offering inspiring and transformational retreats, combining psychological and spiritual teachings with lasting and life-changing effects. An award-winning, critically acclaimed author, he has spoken at numerous universities and conferences and on the TEDx stage as well. And his new book, which we are going to talk about today, Awakening the Soul of Power, was described by multiple Grammy Award winner Gloria Estefan as a balm for the soul of anyone searching for truth and answers to life's difficult questions. So with that being said, Christian, welcome to our show. Thank you so much, AJ. I'm really grateful that, uh, to be a part of your show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so we usually start every conversation from the very beginning. Maybe if you can tell us um, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? I, was, I lived the first 10 years of my life in Cuba. So I lived in, in a communist regime for my first 10 years. Um, one of nine kids um, and the oldest was 12. So only 12 years uh, from youngest to oldest. So grew up really tight. Um, I mean, so much I could say about those years growing up in Cuba. Um, I mean, for one thing, we, we hardly had toys. Uh, so we grew up reading for which I'm really grateful. You know, I developed a, a lifelong lo love affair with books. Um, and also we grew up inventing our games um, rather than, you know, watching TV or playing with toys. We, we had to. Um, and for that, I'm really grateful as well. Wonderful. And so back in those days, what did you want to become when you became an adult? It's, it's funny. Um, my dad was a psychiatrist, so it, so. You know, I thought I might be a doctor at some point, um, but one prevalent theme was just wanting to serve the, the sacred, the divine. You know, in those days, I grew up very, in a very Catholic environment, so that got translated as wanting to be a priest. Um, but, you know, as, as my spiritual uh, development continued to unfold, that began to express itself in different ways. And, these days I'm not ordained by anyone or any institution and, and I know that I don't need to and that in some ways I do play that priestly role still and that I help people connect with something greater than, than themselves. Amazing. And what was your first job like? My first job? Do you remember? <laughs> I do. It was a summer job. It was, um, a, it was like a summer camp. And I was a counselor for, um, for kids, you know, it was like a summer camp for kids. And I was a, a counselor. You know, now that I look back, one of my first jobs was also in a summer camp uh, at YMCA. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just love working with kids and, you know, going forward, I want to have more of these opportunities because I think kids are sort of the innocence of humanity that is still left, right? I mean, yeah. if we are able to intervene and ensure that they are not only protected, but also get the, life, the right experiences at that 
critical juncture, they can grow up to be leaders of tomorrow and be able to relate to power in a completely different light, right? Seriously. And, and what if we really like got together and we taught our kids not only how to pass a test so they could get into college, but what if we taught them, prepared them for life, you know, taught them about the ego mind, taught them about the body and how it functions, taught them, you know, meditation, mindfulness, uh, yoga from a young age so that they wouldn't have to repeat all the mistakes that, that we had to go through. Yeah, not having to repeat the mistakes that we have to go through. That I think is happening in, in some part where people are realizing that meditation and breath work and yoga are indeed practices that children can not only learn, but also share mm -hmm. and have mindful moments with their peers and their grandparents and, and, and parents. And that would be a wonderful world if you're able to spread more of it. Uh, but, you know, you talk a lot about power, right? What is your definition of power? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of confusion in the world about what power is. Um, and most of us have an ambivalent relationship to it. Like we want it, we think we want it, but then we're, we're afraid of it. Um, and, and I think that stems because, because we misunderstand what power is. So, so one of the ways that I, that I, you know, deal with it in this book, Awakening the Soul of Powers, realizing that, that there's at least two different types of power. So there's the worldly power, or what I call also the ego power, um, which gets into this whole other conversation about what the ego is and how it works. And, and that tends to be external, right? So most of us, when we think of power and powerful people, we, what do we think? You know, we think people who have money, uh, who have fame, who, who are high up on a corporate ladder or some kind of religious hierarchy. But the, things that, the thing about all those qualities is that they're outside of us. So by definition, they're kind of fickle. Yeah, they're here today, gone tomorrow. Um, and we're witnessing now in the middle of this global pandemic how, in fact, a lot of those externals are shifting and, and corporations are closing their doors and people are, are losing their jobs. And, and so we are being re have forced to redefine for ourselves who we are and, and our relationship to power. The other part of power that I write about is, you know, I call it soulful power, spiritual power, um, which comes from within, right? And, and nobody can give that to us. Nobody can take it away. And, and, it's so, and, and it's actually more powerful when we really come to think about it. Um, even though worldly power tends to be really kind of arrogant and out, out there and self-serving, it always has an agenda. It's always trying to grab something for itself soulful power or spiritual powers is the contrary. It's, it's, it's about service. It's about making a difference. It's not threatened by other people having power, um, you know, because worldly power thinks that power is a zero sum game, that you're having power takes away from mine. Whereas the spiritual powers is like, wait a minute, who says? Like, why should your power take away from mine? Um, and, and it's humble, like, right? The one is very, the, the worldly power is like, blowing itself up and it's self-aggrandizing and trying to make itself seem bigger than it is and more important than it is. Um, and we don't have to look very far among world leaders to look for great examples of this. Um, and whereas the other one is really humble, like it doesn't need to prove anything to anybody, like it knows that it has power. So I think, for example, I think of a Gandhi um, or a Gandalf, you know, in, in the Lord of the Rings, in their, in their simple monastic robes and their sandal feet, you would never know, right, the power that they hold until it's needed, until it's called for, and then watch out. Like, we know Gandhi, you know, brought the British Empire to its knees when it was at its zenith, at its highest point, without ever landing a punch or shooting a gun. Like, talk about power. That's really interesting um, because like you mentioned, we all have been brought up through our own associations of power, right? And a lot of times power can stem from ego and wanting to feel superior and wanting to control. But what you're saying is if we approach power in a different way, not only do we have that same level of impact and influence, but now you make other people feel good about the fact that you are in this position of power through humility, to, through service, and through, through love. Um, and so 
you talk about the hero's journey, right? Um, for someone who's tuning in for the very first time, has, hasn't heard about the hero's journey, what exactly is the hero's journey? And then maybe if you can tell us, how is that connected with power? Yeah, you know, it's like, even if they maybe haven't heard it framed that way or called the hero's journey, we all know about the hero's journey because it's, it's in all the movies, like in so many of the movies that we watch, like the Star Wars or the Lord of the Rings, they all include the principles of, you know, that Joseph Campbell um, defined, you know, because they've always been there in, 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 from ancient times in literature. Um, and, and so there's this path of the hero, you know, where the hero begins, um, and I say hero gener generically, right? Heroine sounds like something else. Um, so I use hero for, for all of us, regardless of gender. Uh, so, you know, starts in, in, in the safety of, of a town or a village of a nuclear family or something. And then there's some incident that happens. It's like a call to adventure or a call to, to go on a, on a journey. And there's like, you know, seven or eight steps of this journey where, where basically the hero uh, goes out and experiences challenges and like, you know, troubles and uh, discovers uh, him or her or herself and eventually returns back to the village or, or to the family to share the wisdom that they've learned. So, so there's a whole trajectory that Joseph Candle, Campbell identified and named for us. Um, and, in, and, in, and we can apply that to each of our lives, right? And to our relationship to personal empowerment. Um, so in, in the book, which is the, per, the first part of the series. So the book, this book is the first of a series of three. The, the series is titled, calling all heroes. It's like, what does it mean to live a heroic life in the 21st century? You know, when we may not have the horse hitched outside and the armors and the demons to slay, except the ones that are in here. You know, the voices of, of self-doubt, um, our past traumas, our unhealed uh, past traumas, or repressed emotional wounds, um, you know, all, all those things that, 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 that that un un unless we have dealt with them, they're holding us back and, and preventing us from, from having the kind of life and the kind of relationships that we really long for and deserve to have. So this first book on, on empowerment begins with understanding what the ego mind is, which you were speaking about, which is really critical to understand um, because the ego as you know, which we don't have time here to get into into really what it is, because it's 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 a complex complex thought. I mean, complex construct. But here's a great example: if you put a baseball in the center of a stadium, that's what the ego is. Who we are is actually the stadium, and we've allowed this tiny part of who we are, just like tiny tiny baseball part of who we are, to think that it is all of who we are, and to make important choices in our lives. You know, do I, do I stay in this relationship? Do I leave? Do I take that job opportunity that requires that I move somewhere else and leave the, the comfort of what I know? So we make all these big and small choices from its always limited perspective and always fear-based perspective. And, and it's the part of us, as you were alluding to, it's, it's, it's the ego's a control freak. So it's trying to micromanage our lives and everybody else's lives around us, takes everything personally. Um, it's very defensive. Um, so, so in terms of human evolution, it's both a leap in consciousness. Like as far as we know, we're the only species that has an ego, which, which is like a sense of self, right? We can say he, homo sapiens sapiens, the Latin name for, for, for humans. We could translate that as humans who know that we know, right? So it's that ego is, is that self reflexive consciousness that allows us to know who we are. So it's both, again, a leap in evolution. It's also the source of all our suffering. Because once the e ego developed in us, you know, like that individual separate identity, it's like now we can have a lot of experiences that we didn't have when we felt at one with, like the rest of the creatures on the planet. Uh, so now we can have abandonment issues. Um, you know, we can feel lonely. We can feel we have a sense of our own mortality. Um, so there's definitely a price to pay for individualized um, identity. Uh, so in, in the process of, of our, our own heroic journey, 
if we if we frame our lives around this, it's very helpful, right? Because it's it's a we can we frame our lives as a journey of discovery, a journey of adventure, um, and and a huge step of that is understanding what the ego is and both how it can help us and how it keeps us in, in this self-made prison so that we can break free from it. So that's very interesting. And a couple of things that we've already discussed so far. One is you've sort of alluded to the fact that not only do we see the hero's journey play out in movies, in popular movies like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, but each of us might be going through a hero's journey of our own self. And understanding the hero's journey helps us sort of get to know which step and which stage that we are at. And you sort of alluded to that part of this hero's journey is understanding how our ego controls our life and then going or transcending beyond the ego yeah. and awakening to our own heroic self. So for someone who is listening right now, uh, I mean, we do have time. What is the ego self? And what role does it play? Because you seem to suggest that, yes, there are some advantages of having an ego because as human consciousness, we've made a leap, other animals, at least we don't know that they have this sense of ego of knowing that they know. Um, what role does it play in our life, this ego self? Yeah, great question, AJ. There, there's some theories that, you know, we suspect that maybe the higher primates, you know, like the chimps and the gorillas, um, the elephants, the dolphins and the whales um, have a sense of who they are. But we don't really know. Like you're saying, it's like we can't project to how they see themselves. The reason we suspect that they might is because, you know, they'll, they'll do experiments with, say, you put a dog or a cat in front of a, of a mirror. Like we've seen the YouTube videos, you know, where they, then they, start, they interact with that image as if it was another dog or a cat. Then they'll do an experiment where they'll put a higher primate, like a chimp or a gorilla, um, an orangutan, and they'll put ash on their shoulder. And at some point, like they go like this. Mm. Like, so, so it indicates that there's something else going on. There's also another video that you where they put an elephant in front of this huge uh, mirror. And it's almost like you see, it's, it's on YouTube, you, and you see the moment where he or she realizes that it's a mirror, you know, kind of looks around behind the mirror and then kind of gets it and that starts, starts playing with the trunk. So it's, you know, that's great. So there's definitely more advanced self-awareness there, but whether that we can translate that and jump to having an individual sense of personality, we don't know. We just don't know. So we know that we do. Like this is Christian, that's AJ. Ultimately, it's an illusion, right? The ego is, it's a construct and both helpful because it helps me, this, this, this journey of embodiment makes it a lot more interesting. And it's one of the reasons we're so successful as a species. And it's also the source of all our suffering because the ego, you know, it's, the, 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 way, that, the, the way that it is, uh, as I was saying, it's, it's very defensive. So it takes everything personally. Um, and because it's been wounded, you, you know, which is pretty unavoidable in life to, to, to be hurt and to, so it takes all those past things that happened in childhood when a parent was disciplining it, or maybe a, a parent or a teacher lost patience and said something to us like, oh, you're so this, you're like too much of that, you're, you're so stupid or whatever, you know, whatever the parent said, it maybe didn't mean it, right? But to that little ego that doesn't yet even know like that little mind that it doesn't even know who we are, like it takes all those things personally. Mm. And then we develop defenses against them, right? So we, we those of us like had, that grew up with, with like say feelings of like we misinterpreted something and we, we arrived at the conclusion that there's something wrong with me or I'm not good enough. Some of us will go the path of, adding further evidence, right? So we act out, we get kicked out of school, we get caught smoking at break, driving without a license. Each time we do that, we add further evidence to that premise that there's something wrong with us, or we're, we're bad people or whatever. Most of us go the other way, right? So we overcompensate. And we, those are the perfectionists among us, you know, who have to overcompensate to prove to the world and to ourselves that we are fine, that we are okay. 
um, and that we are good enough. And all of it, the tragic part of it is that it all stems from a lie, from a misunderstanding. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting because as you were explaining this, what came to my mind is the journey of ourselves into this uh, life. And ever since we are children, I think children and babies in particular are meaning making machines, right? Because mm -hmm. they're looking around, exploring, making mistakes. Uh, and their ultimate goal, at least in those nascent years, is survival. And that story or drawing those conclusions is critical because otherwise they won't survive. But I think what you're saying also is sometimes because of some random event, we are telling ourselves the wrong story. And over the years, getting more and more evidence to support that narrative, which might actually not be supporting us. Correct. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly. And so in your book, you write, the ego has surrounded and encased itself in layers of armor that have taken years to develop, like scar tissue that keeps getting thicker as it gets injured. So talk to us more about this. <laughs> So, so yeah, so let's say, let's see. So let's say that you and I, and, and I mean, this isn't true. You know, we, we, we haven't met in, in third dimensional reality yet. Um, but let's say that you and I have, you know, that you and I have a, a, an ongoing lunch meeting on Tuesdays. And inevitably you show up late, 20 minutes late. And so there I go, like, you know, like, oh my God, I knew it. I said, damn, I AJ again, he's late. I should have known this. I should have told him I was going to be here, you know, later than I was so that we'd get here at the same time. Or then you arrive. And because we're so conditioned to hate conflict and to be afraid of confrontation, we stuff it, right? So we don't really say what's going on inside of us. And how often do we end up, you know, say yes when inside we like really feel like, no, like it's not okay with us. But to avoid conflict for the sake of you know, pseudo morsels of, of acceptance or love, mm. um, we stuff our bigness, our greatness, and we stuff ourselves into little packages and we put on a fake smile. But then, you know, that frustration, like we can't suppress it, it starts like, you know, leaking out of the side of our voice. So, so that resentment of, for your, about your being late starts like dripping out and, you know, with a, with a joke, with a little hook in it. Or, or barbed remark. Um, and, and so if we want to be free, like understand, like understand that it's, that it's, we have to start by the, with that it's my stuff, right? That's, that it's really one of my wounds. Because saying that we have a friend, you know, Mary, who also has lunch with you on Wednesdays. And when you show up late, she's like, great. I have 20 minutes to catch up on my email or to, you know, get on Facebook or whatever. So, so why is it that she responds that way? And I take it so, I get so upset about it, right? So if, if, the, if we go by what the ego does, the ego immediately, because it it's, has such a limited perspective and it's, it, it has a really hard time owning personal responsibility for any of it. So it's really good about pointing the finger and blaming. So it's all about bad AJ who's always late and how inconsiderate and all that kind of stuff, right? So we build up a story about how bad the other person is. If we want to learn, if we want to heal, if we want to grow, um, the first thing we're gonna do is like, all right, why? You know, like what is what was my role in it or why do I take this so personally? Like, why does it bother me? And so, and it takes work, right? That's part of the reason that it's heroic. Because to say, well, screw that, I'm never going to have lunch with AJ again, it's easy, anybody can do that. But to be willing to like look inside and to ask ourselves, what is really going on here and what are the patterns? That takes work. It takes attention. And it takes the courage of looking at ourselves and looking and maybe discovering parts of us that may not be fun to, to, to feel or to remember. But if we want to be free, if we want to do the heroic thing, it's like, right, that's what we do. So, so let's go in with the same example. Let's say I start like, what, right, so what's really going on here? What am I feeling underneath my, my, my anger, that my, my frustration? Right, what am I really feeling? I'm feeling, you know, disrespected. I'm feeling like AJ is not valuing my time as much as he values his. I'm feeling unseen. And I'm feeling not appreciated. Oh, okay. So I, I felt that before, 
right? It's not just with, with AJ's. When anybody shows up late, I feel those feelings. And in fact, if I zoom out even further, it's not just when somebody shows up late, it's somebody cuts me off in traffic. Somebody steals my parking space. If somebody cuts me off in conversation, it's like it, it evokes kind of the same feelings. Oh, oh, wait, so I'm getting to see a bigger picture here. Make, getting to see a pattern that has nothing to do with AJ, right? So, so what that is, what that points to is one of the old wounds, you know, one of those old scars that we, that it all stems from one of those moments of mis misunderstanding from, from a young age. But it might say, like in this case, it would be, it would probably say something like, well, I'm not worthy of respect. Well, I'm not worthy of love, but because that is such like an intense, difficult thing to own for a little, a little person, for a little mind, we suppress that. Because we don't want to, we don't want to feel that. We don't want to think those things about ourselves. So we suppress them and we hide them in the back of some really dark closet, like in the very corner of those things, that, that belief that I'm not good enough or that I'm not worthy. Uh, but then as we go through life, things happen. And every time one of those things happen, we, we filter it through that, through that old wound, mm. which is not real. But so it's, yeah. it's like a really tragic set of events. So if, if we want to be free, it all starts from getting clear. Like Carl Jung, the psychologist, says that the process of enlightenment is bringing the subconscious, making the subconscious conscious. Right. So we've that's and it's heroic. Right. It takes courage to look in the dark closet and to look at those parts of ourselves that we we stuck in there because we didn't want to feel those feelings. But it makes freedom possible. Yeah, this is really interesting because I think he's also said something along along the lines of until you make the subconscious conscious, you'll keep having the same incidences and experiences and you'll start calling that destiny. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think you've pointed out to a really interesting observation that people can make in their own life as because this current, you know, global climate is forcing us to, you know, be with people, especially at our homes more than before. And in doing so, you're about to get triggered more than before. And what you're implying is that that trigger um, makes us feel in a certain way, which in most cases we're maybe ignoring. The ego wants to be seen, wants to be respected, but that event, like the example that you shared, might make us feel disrespected, like you know we're not uh, worthy of uh, the attention at that particular time. And so what you're suggesting is to really go back in our life and take a step back, look at the other experiences that we might have had over the last couple of months that might have made us feel the same way disrespected yes. so how important is it to go back in time maybe to the first time or first times that we felt the same way maybe in our childhood and is that even possible <laughs> you know sometimes it is like i know you i know you're also a, a breathwork practitioner so i know that people i know that you know that people oftentimes will get to that core wound and will have a memory of it it's like oh my god i remember when i was three and like like I have, a, I have a friend, you know, somebody that I that I work with who had always this feeling of not being good enough and and not feeling like like he sabotaged his relationships before they sometimes even before they got started. So he would act out and then make sure that they didn't work. So in some twisted way, was trying to prevent being abandoned, right? So he was, but in some way twisted away because he ended up with the same result, which was being alone. And in a breathwork session, he had the realization that he had a memory that he, when he was, I don't know, three, four, five, something like that, um, they were in the hospital waiting for his mom, his sister was being born. And I guess he fell asleep and woke up and everybody had gone into the, to the room to see the, the newborn baby. And suddenly he felt abandoned alone and, and totally forgot about that, right? And made all these conclusions, like erroneous conclusions about that. Like they loved her more than him. It's all, you know, all those stories that we make. So, so yes, it's important um, and it's not necessary to, to go to the, to the core wound. And, and before we even get to the point of looking at the patterns, like the first thing we need to do is like 
buy some time, right? Like, because the ego is all reactivity, you know, so that we, out of our, one of our old wounds gets hurt and then we immediately react and we find one of the other person's buttons and we plug there. So, uh -uh, you know, it becomes like a reactive thing. Like I, you know, you figure out my butt and your present, I figure out one of yours and you figure out one of mine until it becomes a battle of the egos until one of us explodes. And then we bring damage, right? We cause harm to our relationships. Sometimes they're salvageable, sometimes they're not. So that's one of the natures of the ego, which is like that immediate defensive reaction thing. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is bring in a moment of choice, right? So rather than reacting when something hurts, where something, somebody does something that we interpret as, as an attack, it's like pause, right? So how do we hit that pause button? And that's one of the ways in which we can learn to use the breath, right? And, and part of it is, First of all, the awareness. And, and it takes a while to, to get to that point because it's so reactive and it's so instinctive to defend. But once, once we apply ourselves to it and, and apply, like learn how to observe ourselves rather than just react. And, and understanding that there's an ego helps us to do that. It's like, wow, rather than me taking everything personally, it's like my ego took that personally. Right? So we begin to disidentify with the baseball and begin to re-identify with the stadium. As we begin to do that, and meditation practices help to, to develop that witness consciousness. Once we're able to do that, we can go, we have that moment, right? All, the, all it takes is a moment of, of choice, a moment of grace, if you would. Ouch, that one hurt. How do I want to respond, right? How do I want to show up in response rather than just reacting? And that is a game changer, right? That mm -hmm. alone, because then we, and, and it doesn't mean we become doormats, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about a journey of empowerment, about a heroic journey. So it's not about becoming a doormat, but it's about bringing choice rather than just reacting and always looking for like what we can learn from it and looking at what was my part in it. In, in every argument and every conflict, there's two sides. Mm -hmm. yeah and and that's another thing of the ego the ego always thinks that it's right always yeah i think this is really useful so what you're saying is that um if we let our ego drive our life then we'll end up playing tit for tat we're always playing these games most yeah. of the reactions happen immediately instinctively without even knowing what's happening and that leads to detriment that leads to the relationship souring or even going bad. And so the first thing you're suggesting is firstly, take a breath, take a pause, right? And take a step back from what is happening so that you can disassociate yourself from the ego clash that's happening and realize that you are not your ego. You are the observer. You're the witness yes. consciousness yes. to the ego battle that seems to be happening. And in doing so, um, along with some breath work or meditation, Maybe you can go back in time and discover when it was the first time you felt hurt. Like the wonderful example that you that you shared of your friend, that's so profound that he or she was able to realize that that incident many years back when his yes. sister was born, and that was, I'm sure, just a few seconds, but that had an effect on him till adulthood. Yes. My question is if- And impacted all his relationships. All his relations. So it's good that he had that epiphany or that realization. But now that he has that realization, what can he do? What did he or she do after that epiphany, that moment? Uh, yeah, that's great. So, so once we see the pattern, yeah, that's I would say that's fifty percent. Okay. Right. So so and then it doesn't mean it's over because it is so habitual. It's like we spend a lifetime protecting ourselves and, and reacting and attacking. Yeah. Um, and taking taking things personally, so so it's going to take a while to to rewire those those brain um, connections and synapses, but it works for sure. It works, and, and I can vouch it from vouch for it from personal experience. Um, like I know depression. My entire adolescence was one long depression. I know self doubt. I know self hatred. Mm. But these days. Like, and, and it's because of understanding how the ego works and it's because of through breath work, healing those old wounds from childhood. 
so that anybody can do this and nothing happens, right? Anybody can press one of our buttons and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so because it's my button, right? It's not, if going back to that late button, if I if I don't do that work, it's not I'm not I'm gonna get upset. Not just when AJ is late, it's when anybody shows up late, it's gonna hit my button, which really wasn't even about AJ. It was about my feeling not good enough or my feeling not worthy. But now I know, right? That then I can do whatever I can do through whatever healing modality, breath works, um, you know, traditional therapy in, in the right hands, um, a good coach who can help us reframe the mental patterns and understand why we do the things we do. And the, to me, the, 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 the most effective healing tool along with that is the breath work because I don't know anything that heals past trauma more, more effectively, more quickly than that. So, so there, there will be a time where we still react in the old ways um, because it is a habit, but it'll happen less and less frequently. Like the ego will grab us less and less frequently. And when it does grab us, we'll spend less and less and less time. Like, like when I learned about the ego, I was in an ashram for, for five years where, you know, we were supposed to be Learn, that's when I learned about the ego, that's where I learned about meditation, learned about breath work. I left, I, you know, when I left the ashram, I got into my next relationship. It was like, oh my God, I thought I was done with that. There it is again. Because one thing is learning it in the abstract. Another one is learning it in the day-to-day -day push and pull of a relationship. Um, and so, but what used to maybe take a week in the beginning because, you know, one of us is sitting on this side, it's like, well, I'm right. And then the other one's on the other side, well, I'm right. And then a day goes by and two days go by and we're still being right. And finally, after a week, somebody says, well, somebody like gives, gives in or, or softens up and, and conversation begins to happen and apologies can happen and then we can proceed. So what took a week initially took three days. After seven years, you know, it was like in and out. Like the stuff would come up and we navigated it quickly, like, like just a little bump. So we get better at, at navigating the stuff. And these days, like no matter what happens in my life, relationship works out or it doesn't. A project succeeds or it fails. Never do I question my self-worth, ever. Like nothing ever, you know, triggers that anymore. So I know that it, it gets healed permanently. Mm. Yeah, I love this conversation and you've sort of explored what happens when you know the other person. But I want to for a minute talk about uh, the dynamics of power in interactions where you don't know the person, where it's a stranger, right? So especially if you're meeting a person for the first time, how does power feature in the interaction? What are some of the subliminal stuff that's happening during that interaction, verbally or non-verbally, when it comes to dynamics of power. Are you able to help us understand that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And so much of it is subtle. Um, and of course, so much of it is, you know, is gender-based um, yep. in, in most parts of the world. Um, so, you know, it could be tone of voice, could be, you know, the, the, you know somebody stepping in, like really close to the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of subtle ways in which power is asserted. Um, interruptions. Um, and, and, and so, 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 you know, so, and that's another thing that's, that's really interesting, that that's going to happen, right? People, people who haven't done their work are going to come in and try to pull power struggles like that and power games. The more that we learn about ourselves, the clearer that we become about who we are and the more that the more secure that we become in ourselves and in our own personal power that doesn't need to prove anything to anybody but we walk around with clear boundaries not we don't need to be we don't need to exert our power over anybody else that, that's another one of the differences worldly power is about power over whereas spiritual power soulful power is power with right so mm -hmm. we we approach the world, you know, it's a different attitude. Like the ego also approaches the world in, in a very descent, defensive way. Like we've confused 
power with with you know like walking around like this especially men by the way you know who've been conditioned not to feel because emotions are supposedly you know we've been lied to and misunderstood they're a sign of weakness where emotions are a weakness they're not strength either they're not good they're not bad emotions are just energies coursing through our bodies we get into trouble with them when we suppress them when we stuff them and, and as a breath worker you know that too right because now we know from quantum physics that energy cannot be destroyed so just because we suppress energy doesn't mean it goes away right so either we suppress it suppress it suppress it until the next unfortunate comes one and they rub, rub us one of our wounds the old the wrong way and poof, volcanic eruption inappropriately mm -hmm. or suppress 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 that energy is going to come out one way or another right if we don't give it expression yeah. heart attacks ulcers uh, cancer right it's going to come out one way or another uh, yeah. so we we better learn you know how to how to navigate our emotions and how to communicate them courageously mm -hmm. and compassionately yeah so for somebody listening right now we're talking about emotions and by its definition emotions are energy in motion and if you don't find an avenue or an opportunity to expre express the emotion that you're feeling and you stuff it up then it's going to like christian mentioned explode at some point it has to come out either through anger or maybe through disease or illness and a lot of times these take years to develop until it's too late uh, but something can be done about this which like we're discussing is breath work and meditation. And Christian, you mentioned, you spoke about boundaries, right? So for someone who wants to stand their ground, be in their own sense of power, not negative power, but positive power, what advice do you have for setting boundaries? Maybe mm -hmm. if it's for somebody you know, but somebody who's not done the work or is not prepared to do the work, and is constantly trying to have these power struggles, right? What, yeah. so what, what can you do in this, in this situation? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, first thing is like, we, we can take off the armor, right? Like we think this is powerful. Um, and you know, we walk with those, we're with armors. That is not powerful. This is prison, right? We're, we're walking around like waiting for the next shoe to drop for the next attack, right? Anticipating the next blow, sometimes sneaking in the first one just in case. Mm. Right, but what are we to live? Right, like this is a prison, and and like we walk around in death cloud one, waiting for that next attack. This is power, right? Uh, this relationship to life is basically saying, no matter what happens, life, I got this. I can handle this. That's a really powerful place to be, and it's really the the power of vulnerability, right? So going back to let's go back to your example, you know, to our example about you being late. If the relationship doesn't matter to me, I can just say, all right, I'm not gonna have lunch with them anymore. But if it's a relationship that matters to me, I, I might, I would have to say something like this, right? And I'm just gonna say some words. We'd have to find our own words to communicate our truth. And so I would have to say, AJ, I, I really love our, our friendship and I love our weekly luncheons. And I gotta tell you that every time you show up late, I feel right? disrespected not cared for i feel like you're valuing your, your time more than i more than mine and i don't want to feel that way can we try to do this a different way that's actually a vulnerable place right because mm -hmm. you can say well screw you that's your problem in which case i know right then that's not a relationship i want to spend a lot of time on uh, more than likely and, and notice the difference right rather than pointing the finger rather than accusing aj you're always late and you're inconsiderate and you don't care about me, right? That's what, we, that's what we tend to do. That's coming from that place of ego, which is blaming and pointing the finger to that other ego that doesn't yet know it's an ego, probably. All that it can do, defend. Mm -hmm. right? That's all it can do. That's all it knows how to do. And every time that we use words like, you always, you're always late, or you never do this, forget it. Like end of conversation, that little ego that doesn't yet know it's an ego might be looking you in the eyes, but inside is going back in time, back in time, back in time to that one time in 2001 where it wasn't late. It's like, wait, yeah. that's not true. I'm not always late. Right. So, so then it gets to be right. Um, so, so first of all, we can take the armors down. Like, like we got this. 
right? And and so how do how do we? But but intelligently, of course, right? If if we're in a relationship that is not good for us, that is abusive in some way, like hey, we don't need to stay around. Mm-hmm. So um, so how do we do this? I know so so that's part of what having healthy boundaries is, realizing what works for us, what doesn't work for us, what uh, what is good for us was not good for us what 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 you know what kind of what kind of life do we do we want and what kind of relationships do we want so that's part of what that that work of self-discovery is interesting hmm i just lost my frame of thought there um what was i saying um can we pause for a minute because i'm hearing some sound yes please that would be awesome Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries at all. So, Christian, you're saying that the solution to a hurt ego is not to hurt another ego because in doing so you're probably not going to get the solution that person is going to be reactive and it'll probably hurt you even more but what the better approach is you know recognizing that you're hurt experiencing what type of emotion you feel and then just vulnerably sharing that with the other person with the hopes that they have the emotional maturity to recognize that they care for you and probably change their behavior so that you both can have a better relationship. And I sense that that is going to have a much better outcome compared to you just reacting and pointing out to their personality rather than a behavior that you just experienced. So I think that's a great approach. Um, You have a chapter called healing the ego, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas um, sometimes people refer to something as the ego death, especially in breath work, or if you experience some kind of plant medicine. Mm -hmm. So do we need to heal the ego or do we need to destroy the ego? And is there a difference between the two? (laughs) That's a great question. And by the way, I love how beautifully you you reframe and uh, synthesize um, everything every little bit. You do a beautiful job of that. Um, and I want to say before I answer that question, I want to I want to say too, like, yeah, absolutely. What you, the way you you framed it or reframed it is absolutely true. Much more effective to to be vulnerable and to, and to express our feelings. And like, if we had the conversation this way and that way and that way and this way and the other way, and the behavior is not changing, it may be time. Right? We may have to make some difficult choices about who we hang around with and and when. Um, so, so to answer the, about the ego death, how what, there are some teachings that uh, some spiritual teachings that say, you got to kill the ego, Mm -hmm. you got to annihilate it because it's the source of all our suffering. And that's true. It is, it is the source of all our suffering. My perception about it, my understanding of it from, you know, from what I've researched and my experience of it is that, that as long as we're in a body in, in this third dimensional reality, that it's, the ego's not all bad, right? It's not a bad thing to have a sense of self. Um, we only get into trouble when we think that that is all we, that we are. So the ego kind of has hijacked its place and thinks that it is, it places itself as the center, right? Like, like it thinks that it's the sun when it's not. So rather than, than killing it, what we got to do is like, like, like understand it, heal it so that, you know, like anybody, if I heal my, 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 I'm um, feeling not good enough button, anybody shows up late, it's like, I have, you know, I just make a choice about it. I don't have to react and take it personally. Mm. Um, so, and so, and so then taking it, removing it from the place that thinking that it is the sun and, and placing it in its proper place in orbit around and in service to the sun. Uh, so, so that's more my understanding of it. 
Right. And I love the analogy that you gave when we started this conversation is that the ego is sort of a spot in the center of that ballpark and is essentially our diminished self, right? Yes. And so I can hear somebody listening to this podcast saying, if that is our diminished self, then who would you say are we beyond the ego? What then forms our identity? How do who's we differentiate this? ourselves from everything around us? <laughs> who is the stadium, <laughs> Um, and, and that's, you know, that's part of the, the hero's journey too, is like discovering, you know, what I call our own piece of sacred real estate. You know, that, that expresses itself uniquely through each one of us. Mm. Um, so, and, and then finding that dance, right? Because it's, it's f- finding in the dance of embodiment, there, there's going to be individuality. So, and there are going to be moments of, of oneness, we, you know, understanding that we're part of it all, that we're an expression of it all. Um, and so that's, but that is part of this amazing, extraordinary journey of embodiment, getting to that place. And then rather than, rather than having this adversarial, you know, you, me against the world kind of, kind of, relationship to life or, or feeling victimized by life if it only hadn't been for that when I was three or that or that or that or if it wasn't what if it only wasn't for sexism or racism or homophobia or for the word the way that the world is then I would be happy but as long as we continue holding someone you know what mom did or father didn't do or the teacher or minister society whatever as long as we're, we're holding others responsible for our state of being for our happiness we just give our power away completely right it's outside of us so so part of this journey is is owning you know, like taking responsibility for every aspect of our lives and and that's nothing short of heroic you know that's why this is a heroic journey mm. feeling victimized anybody can do that right feeling done to anybody can do that and you know the the, the thing about life is like life is going to continue throwing curveballs at us that, that we can count on. It's one of the few things that we're going to get hit with curveballs that we didn't know were coming our way. And so that we can't do anything about, but what we do have a choice about is how we respond, right? How we show up in response to the curveball. Mm-hmm. So, and, and when, we, when we reclaim that, like that's empowering. So that, and that basically means that no matter what happened, no matter what happens, we get to choose how we're going to be in response to that. Talk about empowering and talk about heroic. That's, that's not easy to do. Right. Knowing that we still live in the same world, but we always have a choice uh, in terms of how we react and navigate to our way in this world. So we're not, you know, uh, going somewhere far away, remote, where nobody is going to interact with us, but being part of the same world and uh, enjoying the dance of of life. It sort of reminds me of the Buddhist term called Bodhisattva, right? So the Bodhisattva is someone who seems like they've done their work, their inner work. And in doing so, they've made a decision not to um, eliminate the exposure of life's challenges, but to immerse themselves in it and in the process support others who might be on the same journey of distancing some, themselves from their ego yeah yeah and I, lo- I love that that's one of my favorite concepts in, in buddhism is that that bodhisattva um, vow you know that in my understanding of it and correct me if i'm wrong is that you know that a bodhisattva is somebody who's a being who's achieved full enlightenment so they don't have to continue reincarnating uh, so they're done right? they're just back back to all that is um, but they make a choice to con- to continue reincarnating until not only every human being is enlightened but until every sentient being is enlightened which includes animals and then some people would include plants in that and i love the generosity of that Mm. Um. yeah that is a beautiful metaphor for life and a beautiful way to live as well and a while back you spoke about feelings of 
not being good enough or feelings of insecurity and unworthiness that a lot of us feel and no one is averse to this we at some points depending on the interaction or the time of the day or the time of our year we feel these feelings of unworthiness or insecurity what is the antidote to feeling unworthy without coming across as too egotistical or narcissistic and pushing our way into somebody else's life yeah that's that's support. beautiful aj that's beautiful and i think the antidote is soulful power right because to me what that entails is like knowing who we are to such a deep level that no matter what happens you know like i was talking about earlier no what no matter what happens yeah of course we're going to feel sadness of course we're going to feel disappointment of course we're even going to feel anger those are just emotions that we that that we have but and just course through us freely but that's not who we are right we only get into trouble with those emotions when we suppress them so but we don't take we don't add the meaning like the the way you were talking about earlier the all the meaning machines that we are so we don't add meaning to that so the relationship doesn't work out they left us for somebody else even rather like rather than taking it as a personal rejection and and then giving ourselves that mind trip you know that self inflict inflicted mind f that we give ourselves um you know brings up all our doubts and all our self questioning some of us even close our hearts and that's it we're never going to love again um or make ourselves vulnerable to uh, to anybody else again we're not going to feel like oh my god what what how much power are we giving away to that other person like oh my god power over our hearts power over our ability to love is like no i don't think so right so we feel the sadness we feel the pain of the relationship that didn't work out we miss them but we don't need to take it personally that's optional right we don't need to internalize it and personalize that and, and interpret it as a, as a rejection so if you don't internalize it uh, how do you transmute that energy because it's still an energy right and it's there somewhere Mm-hmm. that sadness that despair that rejection that unworthiness and not knowing how you're going to proceed in the world because if you're in a relationship maybe that's right or wrong but you sort of accept that as status quo right that becomes part of your reality that you sometimes take for granted when you wake up in the morning that's just you know your life so now that that incident has happened how do you work with that energy how do you transmute it and how do you you know how do you move on yeah and, and i can i mean i can tell you from personal experience that the interpretation of it goes away like i just went through that right with a relationship that didn't work out mm. and sure i i went through the sadness of it and maybe even the disappointment of it but never never did i question my self worth I, so so that's the part that that does get healed how do we heal that right it's that combination of understanding right the ego understanding how it works doing the work of zooming back so that we can see the patterns and we can the breath work in my experience was like i don't know anything more effective you know i'll say that again um you know I, like i often say my dad was a psychiatrist my degree is in psychology i was on a track to get a phd in psychology when i discovered breath work i jumped tracks i never went for the phd because it works so fast and heals so profoundly at so many levels so for me it's that combination of both the understanding the cognitive understanding of of what's happening in the mind of of being willing to do our of the work of looking at our histories and understanding the patterns of why we do the things we do which takes work and it takes time but it's so worth it it is so worthwhile because that's the key to freedom combined with breath work which bypasses the mind and it goes to the source of that trauma and clears it mm got it so if somebody is listening i hope you know so it's a combination of having that cognitive awareness but then also doing the breath work so you have a physiological influence on your entire system your body your blood you know your lungs but it also influences your brain and helps with clearing that emotional emotion whether it's happening on an emotional or even a spiritual basis just that sense of profound connection that 
love and that appreciation that you experience, it transcends that pain or that discomfort that you might be having because of that uh, broken relationship and that you might have experienced. You go beyond that and you still have that challenge, but now you look at it, look at it from a different vantage point. Um, yes. And, and to add a little bit to that, the reason that the breath work is so effective is that that trauma, right? So whatever it happened, like, like my friend who was in the hospital, like he could understand that he can go to therapy and, and understand it, but it doesn't necessarily change the behavior, right? Because that trauma no longer lives in the mind. That trauma now lives in the body has been somaticized. So no amount of understanding and talking about it is going to get to it. That's why it's a great combination, the cognitive understanding and the breath work. Because the breath work goes to the source of the trauma that now lives in the body and it clears that blocked energy, clears it out of the body. So you were sharing that story where you were on track to get your degree, but then you came across breath work. How did you come across it? What's the story like? I was, um, I was at an interesting point in life. I was approaching a significant, you know, one of the significant age barriers, I think it was the 3.0. And I had a very comfortable job, very cushy job. I had a very enviable life. I was living um, in South Beach, right when the Renaissance was here in Miami, right when the Renaissance was starting there. Um, I, you know, I had a good relationship, sought after socially, professionally, cushy job with very, a lot of free time and, um, I was reading, but it seemed to me the more that I had, the more that I was sought after, the more that there was something missing. Mm. Um, and I started to little by little re begin to re-explore uh, spirituality and started looking East, right? I started looking at the religions and traditions of the East, at Hinduism and Buddhism and understanding the concept of the ego from that perspective rather than the more Western psychological perspective. Um, and I was reading, standing by the pool and reading something spiritual and somebody who lived in the building came and told me about breath work. And it was like an instant knowing as I got it. Yeah. Tell me when and how much and I'm, I'm there. And it changed my life. My first session changed my life. Mm. And who do you say are some leaders today that demonstrate soulful power? Hmm. That's a good question too. Um, you mean political leaders or religious leaders or what? Of any leaders, leaders of any kind, maybe notables so that people can recognize. Um, all right, here's, here's an interesting example from, from US. If, you, if, you know, if you're familiar with US politics. And by the way, I think in some ways, Jacinda, in Arden in New Zealand, I think she embodies and of course, I don't know them personally, so I don't know how they are, but from an outside perspective, um, she seems to have a very soulful power approach to it. Your, your um, prime minister, Trudeau, in some ways, you know, not, nobody's perfect, mm -hmm. uh, but in some ways, the way his inclusive approach, to me, that's, that's um, symbolic of, of, of soulful power. Um, and, and there's a sense of, of self-assuredness and, and not being threatened by others um, and, and looking at looking focusing on the US I'm not even going to mention the current state of affairs which are sad and tragic um, and, and we can get into it if you want but I think a more helpful environment uh, example I mean is looking at when Obama was running against Hillary and it was interesting to me that understandably you know, because I don't know if somebody told her or whether it's just in the ethers and Hillary probably thought, you know, that that she needed to be extra tough, right? To like, so she started behaving like in a more masculine patriarchal expression of power, mm. like in a more worldly power kind of thing. Well, we got to go out there, we're going to kick ass and blah, 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 you know, like, like extra, extra hawkish. Whereas, because in, at some level, she probably thought that in, to be seen as a credible leader, she had to, be, to behave that way. Um, 
which is kind of, it's a little twisted, but it's, it's the world that we live in. Whereas Obama, in many ways, embodied a more feminine expression of power, which by the way, it's even more powerful. Um, because I know that the instinctive thing, reactive thing is, oh my God, feminine is less powerful. But no, not at all. Um, talk about the power of creation. I mean, just as one example, um, the, 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 creation, the creation of life, talk about power. Um, and so, so, you know, so Obama's approach about inclusivity, about having everybody at the table, uh, that's a more traditionally feminine approach to power. Um, and interestingly enough, we're, we're in, Hillary was going in the second time around where she was against Trump last time. Now she had a lot more experience. She had been Senator, she'd been Secretary of State. She had a lot more confidence um, and, and probably felt more credible as a leader. So there was a total shift from the, that, from the initial you know, run against this most recent run. Um, whereas even her, the way she dressed was, was softer. She spoke about love. She had grand, you know, spoke about her grandchildren, spoke about love from, from the days. Um, so I, you know, I, I find that interesting. I find that as a, a helpful example. Mm. And what's it like to be in the presence of someone who is demonstrating this kind of soulful, uh, someone who is aware of their feminine and masculine uh, aspects of power, someone who is graceful. What's it like to be in the presence of someone like that? And they did not be politicians, but someone who exudes this sort of power. I think you feel it. I think we feel that. You know, we may not be able to, to have the words to explain it, but there's a sense of, um, you know, the exudive kind of self-assurance like the, the, the aspect of not needing to prove anything to anybody is like, like you, you just know, right? You just know, like there's nothing to prove. That's very freeing and, and very, it's like, what a relief to be in the presence of somebody who's not trying to prove anything about themselves. They just get to be who they are. What a, what a, what a how relaxing, what a, what a relief, how rejuvenating it is, it is to be in the presence of somebody like that and somebody who's not threatened by other people, by other people's power. They just get to be who we are and they allow anybody else to be who they are. So they celebrate other people being at their, at their best. They're, they're not threatened by other people's excellence. So what advice do you have for someone who is listening to this episode right now and somebody who wants to seriously practice and refine their qualities in themselves? Uh, what should they be doing on a daily basis uh, to to develop this soulful power? And how did they go about measuring the progress? <laughs> well, by the book, that, that'll help you understand it more. But three, three things I think are important. Self-awareness, right? Self-observation. There, there's no way around that. So, so, so that's a, a skill that we have to develop, you know, which, which entails going within. Um, and, and like in the old days, in the old temples, uh, you know, that was at the entryway, know thyself. And, and even if you want to, it almost sounds cliche to say that you can't really love anybody else until you love yourself. And you can't really love yourself until you know yourself. Mm. It's like you really know yourself and all of you, including all the stuff that we try to hide away at the, at the back of the closet, right? But we have to own all of it. Um, so self-observation, right? And that comes a lot from any kind of meditative practice. You know, even, even if it's sitting meditation, where 99, maybe 95% of the time is going to be boring, right? Yeah. It's gonna be, you're going to be watching your thoughts and counting your breaths or staring at a, at a flame or, or whatever meditation practice you do. And then you, oh, there I go doing my shopping list. Oh, there I, you know, brought myself back from reliving the argument that I had with my my co-worker last time and just wait till I get to the office. This is what I'll tell her, right? So we bring ourselves back from the future and from the past. Most of the time is that, that's the work of meditation. But the benefit of that is that that builds our self, you know, that's, that's like practicing for the piano concert or for the marathon, right? So that's that sitting those 10 minutes a day or five times a week of self, of observing ourselves when the rubber hits the road and we're in the argument is escalating with, with one, in one of our relationships or we're about to get triggered and the, the ego is going to just 
hijack us is that's when that awareness comes in it's like oh wait a minute wait a minute i'm feeling this way i'm feeling like that one hurt how do i want to be that's what that's what allows the moment of choice to come back in so self-observation meditation some kind of so meditation practice the breath work again like, like i don't know anything more effective um in terms of, of healing all that stuff and in terms of also emptying out all that cauldron of repressed emotions that we have spent, that we walk around in after a lifetime of suppressing our emotions. And, and that is so important because until we do that, our relationships are really gonna be troubled because here, you know, here we are trying to have a relationship in the present moment. All of it is getting filtered through that lifetime of suppressed and repressed emotions, which we, until we become aware of them, then we're gonna project on each other and dump on each other's lap. Like how any relationship works, it's really mind boggling because we haven't been taught how to approach relationships. And by the way, that's what the next book is about, which will be out next year in 2021, um, about how to do relationships consciously. Um, and, and, and so that then, you know, once, once we're, we're, we're able to clear our emotions, then we can be with each other in the present and have our emotions and not be had by our emotions. Love that. So what you've shared is know thyself, own thyself, love thyself, do the practices so that you notice when thyself is wandering around. <laughs> and then when you, in, in the moment of truth, when you're having that trigger, because you've done the practice, and because you know your whole self, yes. you're able to move beyond and not be in that need for feeling unworthy or seeking approval because you stand in your power. That's right. So, so thanks a lot for sharing all of that stories, the approaches, the strategies so far, Christian. I'm sure our listeners have now a different and a renewed perspective of how they relate to their own personal power. And with that being said, it's the wisdom round for today, the last round, which contains four questions so that our listeners can take note and take action. So the first one is, what is the best piece of advice that you have received? You know, um, I don't know if I received this, but the go within, um, that is a really, really good piece of advice. A more recent one, and it's at a whole different level, um, but it's from a, one of my business coaches who also lives in Vancouver, by the way. Um, but she says, her name is Christina uh, Jandali, and she said, better done than perfect. So it's more in performance business related thing, but, but it addresses the perfectionism of the ego, right? So just get it done rather than wait, like keep trying to perfect it. And if you could turn back time, spend one hour with someone who's living or dead, who would it be? Hmm. Well, because, because I'm on a mission and because I feel that the critical nature of the times that we live in, and because I feel like paraphrasing Einstein, that, that you can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness in which it was created. So when I look at the, at the reality of the world in which we live I, and the complexity of all these huge problems, the way that I think, the only way that I think we dig ourselves out of this hole that we have collectively dug ourselves into, it's like we have to think outside of the box. So from my, my perspective, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual answer. It's a spiritual revolution that's going to take. So if I were going to speak to one person today who could help me spread this message the most, I think that would, that would have to be Oprah, who in, in some ways has at least in, in horizontal numbers, in terms of people that she has reached, I don't know anybody else who has reached that many people with a message of awakening. And what is that one thing you do in the morning or in the evening before you go to sleep that has improved your life? The breath. 
That's my breath. I, I, even before I get out of bed in the morning and, and the last thing I do um, as I'm falling asleep, or if I wake up in the middle of the night, like to get back to sleep, it's slow down the breath, right? And, and breathe consciously, even if I just do it 20 times and, and not the intense breathing that, that you and I know from breath work, but a more, you know, like coherent breath, breathing. You do slow, deep breaths and, and, you know, maybe do a count of six seconds, inhale, six seconds, exhale, and just focus on that. And, and um, you know, going back to that, that point of, of crisis when we're about to get reactive, there, there's swamis in India, as you know, um, who have that much control over their body that they can tell the heart to slow down and it will. They, they can even, some of them can mimic states that can't be differentiated from death, that you know, kind of look like death. We're, most of us are probably not gonna get to that level, uh, this lifetime at least, um, but anybody can slow down the breath. Anybody can do that, it's not hard. It just takes a choice and a little bit of self-discipline. Um, when we slow down the breath, the heart has no choice. The heart has to slow down. When, when the heart slows down, everything begins to change, right? The body begins to relax, the, the, ner the nervous system begins to quiet down. So whatever we're feeling stressed out in traffic before an important meeting or before we go on um, and on stage or something, use the breath. So I should drive a hang on because we are going to do a breath work session, a short session before we end today's episode. And we are going to do the heart coherence breathing, actually. Excellent. It's interesting that you mentioned that, but we are going to do that. Uh, but one question before we get started, what is one book that you'd like to recommend for our listeners hmm. today? You know, I got to, one of my favorite books is by Brian Swim, a physicist, a cosmologist. It's called The Universe is a Green Dragon, um, in which he, and it's short, it's readable, it's kind of in Socratic, you know, dialogue or teacher dialoguing with student. And so what he does is he applies universal principles that govern the, the stars, that govern the cosmos to the human experience. Because much to the surprise of some human beings, we're part of the cosmos. So we're also going to be ruled or impacted by the same principles that govern the stars. So my favorite one of those is cosmic generosity. And so he talks about the cosmic generosity of a supernova when a supernova explodes and it gives up its life, right? it gives up its form. As a result of that ultimate act of generosity, what happens, right? Suns and moons, planets, life are born, life occurs. And so, and he talks about how we are made of 99.99% of the atoms in our body are the same stuff, the same atoms found in the stars, so that we are literally star beings. We are made of star stuff. And so that means that we too have that same desire for cosmic generosity to give ourselves away um, and how different we, we'd live if, if we came from that place. So Action Drive, would you like to receive one book for free. And in fact, you can get this specific book because audible.com is offering all our listeners one free audiobook download with a free 30 day trial so that you can check out their amazing service. Uh, it's an audiobook. So just like a podcast, you'll be listening to the book. And in most cases, the authors themselves read out the book to you and you can you know listen to it whenever you want uh, through your phone. So if you want to get Cosmic generosity for free. Go to my seven chakras.com forward slash free book. Once again, my seven chakras.com forward slash free book. I know many of you have claimed your credit, but get your credit and start listening. So, Christian, thank you so much for joining us today on today's episode. Before we start the short meditation, tell us one thing that you're grateful for and how can we find you online? You know, I'm grateful for you and for you being this fulcrum of consciousness. And, and I'm actually grateful for this messy, messy, incredibly difficult year. You know, for me, um, it, it allowed me to be home for nine months. And it's what allowed me to, to finish this book, which I've been, it's been brewing in me for 10 years. So I'm grateful for that. And, and with all of its challenges and all its tragedy and all of that, I'm grateful for this year. Thanks for sharing. Action Tribe, 
If you've enjoyed this episode so far, then make sure you join our podcast exclusive Facebook group uh, because, you know, we have all our official discussions. We have breathwork sessions and we've got some amazing events lined up for you in 2021. Go to my7chakras.com forward slash tribe. That's my7chakras.com forward slash tribe. Now, Christian, you didn't mention the link that people can go to to no. talk more about you. <laughs> soulfulpower.com is my website. Awesome. We'll have this link up in the show notes. We'll have a link also so that people can get your book wherever they choose to get their books from, but we'll have the link up in the show notes. But with that being said, let's bring in our breathwork round. (laughs) Uh, But we're going to do a breathwork session and action tribe, don't do this while you're driving. I know many of you drive while listening to this podcast. So wait till you come home, (laughs) especially if you're submerged in water, just wait till you're back home in a safe space where no one will disturb you and that you can close your eyes. And we're going to breathe in from the nose, breathe out through the mouth. All right. So keep that in mind as you breathe in, Imagine the air going down your body and all the way till your belly. In other words, when you breathe in, your stomach is going to inflate. As you breathe out through your mouth, you're going to let out the air. All right. I'm going to set up the music so that we can... Just give me a moment. All right. So if you're in that comfortable position, you can be seated on your seat or you can be in a lotus posture. Just close your eyes and pay attention to your breathing as you breathe in and out. Go back to a place of deep gratitude. Any time in your life where you were with friends or people that know you, love you, support you, and imagine that sense and that feeling of gratitude at the center of your heart, and it's spreading across your body, your hands, your torso, your legs, your face, as you start enjoying this music. Let's begin. When I say in, you're gonna breathe in through your nose. When I say out, you're gonna breathe out through your mouth. Just relax all over. Bring up that feeling of joy, of excitement, gratitude for 2020, and excitement for 2021. Knowing that you are in a safe space, comfortable place, and you can breathe yourself to freedom. Inhale. Up. Lean. Exhale. Inhale, out, in through the nose, out, breathing all the oxygen into your bloodstream, your cells, your blood vessels, and as you breathe out, you're going to purse your lips, imagine you're breathing out through a straw, that's right. Pull in, out, inhale, out, two, three, four, pull in, out, in, out. With every second, you are becoming more and more relaxed, more and more at ease. Releasing your stress, 
with the exit. That's right. Fully in, take it in. Out. And in. Out. Inhale. Out. In. Out. Fully in. Out. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. When you balance your inhales and exhales, you influence your heart. Your heart starts sending harmonizing signals all across your body, allowing you to relax, allowing you to let go. Fully in. Out. And in. Out. Take it in. Out. Breathe it in. Breathe the love in. Out with the stress. Let it go. Fully in. Exhale. Inhale. Out. Take it in, take it in. Leave the stress, let out the stress. Inhale. Out. Take it in, take it in. Out. In with the love, the appreciation, the gratitude. Out with the stress, that's right. Take it in, out, and in, out. Breathe normally now. You've done really well. We're going to take about 30 seconds or 40 seconds to really be in this silence and really give ourselves this time to embody the vibrations that we've created. And whenever you're ready, you can wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, open your eyes, come back to the present moment. Thank you everybody for joining us on today's session. Thank you, Christian, for gracing us with your presence, talking to us about such important topics like power, the ego, and how we can all transcend that and develop a new form of leadership that can take our human civilization to the next level in 2021. I appreciate you. Thank and you, Ajay. Thanks, everybody.